Well, good morning, Concord Church. How are we today? Okay, all right. I know the turkey was good. I know we still got a little food coma going on. Hey, but y'all gonna have to come with me today, all right? I'm gonna try this again. I'm gonna give you a second chance, all right? Hey, good morning, Concord Church. How are we? Okay, there we go. That's a little better. Well, hey, happy Thanksgiving. I am so glad all of you have made it here today. I hope you and your family and friends had just a fantastic time together. I know all of us probably ate a little too much, but it was great time to be together. I just want to start off by saying how thankful I am that each and every one made uh, of you made a priority to be here today. I think it is so important that we come together to worship together. Now, if this is your first time at Concord, you're new to us, I hope that you have felt so welcome, that, that from the parking lot to the lobby to this room to, to, to our campuses, wherever you are, that you've just been overwhelmed by people greeting you. Because that's really our expectation of Concord is that when you're here, that you are known that you are seen, that you are encouraged, and that ultimately you leave here being ministered to by the body of Christ. Now, for, for you guys that are joining us online, maybe you haven't made it back to town or you're kind of just kicking the tires of, of, of being around, we want to say thank you so much for joining us online. We, we hope that you'll share this link with a friend to pass it along because we believe God is going to do something today. Now, last week, I asked Brandon, who's our executive pastor of ministry, to, to, to teach on Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and really cover this idea of baptism. Now, I'll just say this. From getting to be here, I was blown away by his gifting, by his anointing to handle God's word. It was incredible that I got to sit under his teaching. Didn't Brandon do a great job last week? Can y'all give it up for Brandon? Man, I love that, that it's not just me, that we have team that can then fill this, but for my family and I, we had a neat opportunity. Because with Brandon preaching, we were able to go and hang out at one of our campuses. So at 11 o'clock last week, we went and our family did church at our Habersham campus. And I'm just telling you, it was amazing. It was wind in our sails. Because when we got out of our truck, there was literally some dude in the parking lot going, hey, we are glad you're here. And I was like, I'm glad you're here, right? I mean, it was just speaking my love language. I was like, yeah, people are excited. I mean, we get in, we get to the coffee station and people are like, oh man, it's so great to see you. And people are talking to my kids and, and my wife and we get into the worship center and then all of a sudden there's people getting in there and serving in the tech booth and warming up with musicians and running things. And I was like, man, what a beautiful picture of our church at multiple campuses. I am so proud of our campus pastor, Dusty, and just the environment that he's created at Habersham, which I learned last week, they call themselves the Sham Fam, which I love. So Sham Fam, y'all are amazing. Thank you for letting us worship with you guys last week. And so with that said, Claremont, will you welcome in all of our campuses joining us in this moment? Delonica, so glad you're here. Mount Yona, our Sham Fam. Man, we just love being a church that has multiple sites and we get to get together right after Thanksgiving and study God's word. I, I'm just so thankful for Concord. I'm, I'm thankful for every campus. I'm thankful for every family. I'm thankful for every one of you. And, and, and I love it because it just flows out of Thanksgiving being my favorite holiday, all right? So in our family, we rank holidays. And for me and my son, it's like Thanksgiving 500 feet before the next holiday, right? Because it's super low key. I mean, all you really have to think about is family and friends, food, and football. Like, I mean, there's no expectations other than just hanging out. And so we, we decided every year that, that we're gonna make Thanksgiving a little bit extra, right? And so for years, we've been doing these 5K turkey trots. And so we're no longer in Texas or Oklahoma. So we just said, hey, you know what? We're gonna find one here. So we get on this turkey trot because we have made it up in our minds from the 93 calories that you burn walk running three miles, you can eat 10,000 calories at lunch and it evens out. And, and so that's what we did. And we got to see students from our ministry. We got to see adults. We got to see families and just hanging out in Gainesville doing this 5K. But it wasn't just that that helped us enjoy our first Georgian Thanksgiving. We were really initiated into Georgia on the night before Thanksgiving when uh, we got hit by a deer. 
And, and let me be clear, we did not hit a deer. A truck coming in the opposite direction hit a deer and sent it flying into us oncoming traffic where we hit a deer and it tore out the front of our car. And, and, and I'll say this, um, everyone was okay in all of the cars, the deer not so much. But, but it was crazy because for us city folk, we, we don't know what to do. And so I get a phone call, it was my wife and daughter in the car and they said, hey, can you come pick us up? I said, what happened? We were in an accident, what do I do? I said, call the police, we get there. Man, there's an ambulance and I'm going, what is going on? I pull up, three cars have been hit by this deer and we're just standing there and everybody's acting like it's no big deal. And they're like, yeah, man, this is what deer do at night. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Well, then if we become like the spectacle out on the two-lane highway, and you see the people kind of slowing down to look. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're here, nice for the parade. And who are these people that are just going to stop and look? And one pulls up and stops in the middle of the road. I mean, there's flashing lights, cars wrecked, dead deer, and, and just rolls down their window. It's our student, Pastor Mason. Hey, guys. What happened? Hit a deer. Y'all okay? Don't know. Can I do anything? Not sure. All right, see you later. I think he was going to Walmart. But it was just a normal occurrence. So we feel very Georgian now having our first car hit by a deer. But in all seriousness, we were overwhelmed by how loving our community was. I mean, we had people offer us cars to, to where to go for this and what to do and if they can do and checked on us. And I mean, I'm just telling you, I love doing life with this community at Concord. It is just a blessing from God. And I'll tell you this, today we are gonna get geared up for God to move because we are finishing off our Greater Than series, our study in the book of Acts. It has been eight weeks that we have just been flying through, just skimming the top of what God did in the early church. And I've loved this series because it has been crazy convicting. Because y'all got to understand, we study this passage and I've got to take all this in before I can preach it. So God is just doing work on me. But I love that he has raised the standard for who we need to be as a church as we move forward in the days ahead. I mean, this week, uh, these eight weeks have just flown by. We've been challenged together. We've caught a glimpse of what God wants to do in you and through our church. And I'll tell you this. I am more excited today than when we started Acts because I had no idea the excitement God is putting in my heart for what happened, what's gonna happen in the days ahead. I hope you guys are ready for God to knock your socks off in what he wants to do in the days ahead. And literally my prayer today, I was praying this morning, God, would you speak? I, I, I just want God to mess y'all up today. Like Thanksgiving's been great. I want y'all to just be messed up like, oh my word. Like God is doing something in me. Because we're gonna look at a man who had his life radically changed by Jesus. And all of us are probably sitting in the wake of the ministry that he did. And there's this truth that rises to the top for us to finish off our greater than statements that says this, God's future is greater than my past. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, God's future is greater than my past. And today we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, where we are going to be looking about what happens when one heart is transformed by Jesus. That that one spark of life change, that one moment can start sweeping revival wildfire. And I'm hoping that it comes very close to us. Now, Acts chapter 9, as you know, is a very common passage in the Bible. And a lot of times we kind of make it very singular about the conversion of a man named Saul. He's kind of the villain in the early chapters of, of Acts. And, and we see him get knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus, makes a 180 turn, and then all of a sudden becomes one of the most impactful leaders, believers, Christ followers to ever walk the planet. But church, I just want to simply propose this morning, there's more to Acts chapter 9 than just a conversion of a man who sets the world on fire. There is a whole story beneath that that plays into what God is doing. And so church, I really want you to grapple 
with what we're talking about today. I want you to wrestle with it. I want you to, to go to lunch today and over your chips and salsa or your, or your barbecue or your, your leftovers at home that you're sitting at lunch, you're talking about this. Tonight, when you, you get ready to close out the day and you begin to pray, that you begin to pray for opportunities to embody what we're talking about. As you plan your week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're looking, how can I live out what God has shown me today in Acts chapter 9? I'm praying that God messes with you today. So, would you do me a favor? As we do many times here, when we read God's word, we stand and honor that. So I want to ask everyone to stand with me when I read a portion of Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 says this, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he asked, for, uh, asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Come on, y'all, this is just priming the pump for where we're going. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that in this moment you would excite our hearts, that from the throne of heaven you would speak a word over your people today, that you would give us excitement, you would give us the realities that we need to see, that our lives can line up with what you're doing. God, we just want to say in this moment we are yours. Speak to us clearly. We love you and pray in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. You can grab a seat. Now, here's the, the, the three realities that I want you to, to grapple with this week, that I want you to wrestle with, that I want you to really look at. And the first one is this. Jesus can change you completely. Jesus can change you completely. Can I get an amen on this? Man, aren't you glad that you didn't just get a, 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 a refurbished you, a, a you 2.0, a you a little bit better than a, a, a you uh, that is used, but a little bit newer, I am glad that Jesus changes completely. I am glad that I am no longer the man I was. Amen? Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says this, and Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Let's just stop right there. Think about this guy. It says Saul, is breathing threats and murder. Like how angry does someone have to be that their very breath is a threat and murder against somebody? Like you gotta have some serious angst in your heart, some serious hurt, some serious turmoil. But I bet all of us have kind of walked that road a time or two, right? You ever had something inside of you that, I mean, it's just like a fire? Like you're angry, you're mad, you, you, you're just, you can't hardly contain it. All of your energy is spent to try to keep this thing from exploding. Well, Saul, he begins to, 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 to let this just kind of pull out of who he is. And Saul is a mess of a man. But that's not what jumps off the page to me. Him breathing threats and murder against the disciples. It's this third word, but Paul still that this is kind of who he is. This is still going on. So go back to Acts chapter 8, 1 through 3, and look at what we see here. It says this, and Saul approved of his execution. That's Stephen. Remember a couple of weeks ago, Stephen was chosen to serve. He was a man full of the Spirit. And then he began to, he was persecuted and killed for Christ. It says, Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. And he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Saul is an angry man, a wounded man a violent man who was ravaging the church. He was against anyone who named the name of Jesus. There's no cultural Christianity here. You want to live for Jesus? You got this guy following you. He had no time 
for people who followed Jesus. It says, so he went to the high priests. Acts 9-2, and he asked them for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, now just think about this for a second. Jerusalem is here. This persecution has spread all of the disciples to Judea and Samaria. This is Acts 1-8 happening through persecution. Well, now he's at Damascus. Damascus is about 135 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So it'd be like us driving from here to Asheville, all right? About a two-hour drive, but for him, probably a six-day walk. And he's going there to stomp out this burgeoning church, these followers of Christ. And and it it says uh, here in verse uh, uh, 4, it says, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Underline that in your Bible. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But I want you to rise, I want you to enter the city, and you will be told what you are are to do. Then the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days was without sight, and he neither, neither ate nor drank. You know what I think is crazy about this story? Saul, on the road to Damascus to go stomp out Jesus, gets knocked off his horse, blinded, and then God says, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, who are you? And in three words, his life begins to change. I am Jesus. And all of a sudden, Saul, who's been in control of everything, is no longer in control of anything. Because God takes control here. And in the Greek, there's two imperatives, which are commands. And he says, I want you to rise. So you're on the ground because I put you there. You stand up and you go into that city and you wait until I tell you what's about to happen. God is now in control. And I'll tell you this. It is amazing to me that in our culture, that, that we think that Jesus operates very differently. That God is in control. We do not get to tell God what to do. He gets to lead us. But watch what happens when we flip the coin to the other side of this situation in the same town. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now this is a different Ananias than in chapter 5. It's, it's a common name. Then the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Can you imagine that quiet time for just a second? All right, you just, you got your cup of coffee, and the kids aren't up yet, you're drinking, you're reading your Bible, and he's like, Steve? And you're like, yes. Here I am, Lord. You know, I mean, he just talks right to him. It, it's just incredible. And then verse 11, it says, the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, I want you to look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. And behold, he's there praying. Now he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He's literally arguing with God. He's like, God, do you know what you're asking me to do? See, this guy is actually trying to kill or imprison all these other people who call on your name. I don't know if you're out of the loop or not, but this guy's bad news. But the Lord said to him, go. And he could have ended that sentence right there. He just says, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Church, can I get real for just a second? There's a lie out there that that a lot of us have been around. And it's simply this, that if you give your life to Christ, your life will get easier. That is a bold-faced lie. 
if you follow Christ, your life will get significantly more difficult and complicated and hard because now we are strangers and aliens in this world and it doesn't make any sense. There's also this understanding in 1 Corinthians that we have been bought with a price and we are no longer our own. That a couple of weeks ago when we put our yes on the table, we think at some point that that is something that we have control over. Here's what I need you to understand. You have been bought with a price and God gets saved. It's not our experience. It's not our preference. It's not our want to. It's God, what do you want me to do? My life is laid at the foot of your cross. You do with it what you will. And what he said here is, I need you to know something, Ananias. Saul doesn't get a say. He is a chosen instrument of mine. And in his past, his mistakes, his temperament, his hurt, I'm going to take all of that and I'm going to make it brand new and I'm going to use him before kings and other places. But I'm going to let you know he's going to have to wear it. He's going to suffer for my name's sake. Church, here's the message. When we follow Christ, it ain't going to be easy and the road will be hard. But that's what we signed up for. Amen. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and he entered that house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may, be, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was a physical healing that happened first and a spiritual indwelling that happened second. He regained his sight and he was filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was what? He was what? He was baptized and he then took food and was strengthened for some days. He was with the disciples at Damascus. The very first thing that the persecutor of the church, the imprisoner of the way, the man who was breathing threats and murder gets knocked off his horse, gets blinded for three days, eats and drinks nothing, pondering what is happening in his life. A man comes and prays for him, heals him. And then the first thing he does before he takes a bite of food is he's baptized. He was declaring to everyone, I was against Jesus and now I'm with him. I am buried in his death, raised to walk in his newness of life. And Concord, that's exactly what we celebrated last week. For weeks you've been hearing about this baptism Sunday that we're going to have. And, and what we saw across all of our campuses, all four of our sites had baptisms last Sunday. There were 14 people who said, yes, I am standing up in front of Jesus, uh, in front of everybody for Jesus. From little kids, to teenagers, to college students, to to young marriage, to men, a man in his 70s. They all stood up and said, I'm with Jesus. How amazing is that? How amazing is it that our church is celebrating stories of life change? It is amazing. It has me so fired up, I'm about to lose my mind. Because what I know to be true, that a man who walked this earth, died on a cross, beat death, who died 2,000 years ago is still changing lives today. That's the God we serve. It's the understanding that Jesus can change you completely. But here's the second thing I want you to wrestle with over lunch and, and tonight when you pray is this. We now have a clear message to share. We have a clear message to to share. Look at verse 20 in chapter 9. It says this, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, underline it, circle in your Bible, he is the son of God. There's an important word in there. It's that word immediately. He, he didn't say, oh, when I know a little bit more, when, when I study, when I can take that class at church or when I can get some systematic theology or learn the Christian lingo or, or this, that, or the other. It says immediately, out of his life change, hating the, the, the followers of the Lord, persecuting Christ, knocked off his horse, blinded, healed, filled with the Spirit, baptized, immediately he began to say, he is the Son of God. 
out of his change came a powerful message because he knew in that moment that who he was in his past, a man angry, a man broken, a man messed up, beaten by the world, headed for hell and a Christless eternity, had now met Jesus and he couldn't stop talking about him because his life had been changed. He knew that Jesus was the only way. You know, we see that everywhere in Scripture. Look at John 14, 6. It says this. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. How many? No one. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12, which we studied a month ago, says this. And there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus changes everything. And now we have a clear message to share. Look in verses 21 and 22. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man? Now, you know when I read that statement, you know what I think of? High school reunions. For me to go back to a a high school reunion now and I walk in and they're like, hey man, what have you been up to the last 20 something years? I'm a pastor. And they're like, say what? Man, aren't you the, yep. Weren't you the guy who, uh uh-huh. Can you believe that you're, can't believe it. I'm so glad that Jesus changes completely. Because I have a story to tell. And it says, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? For those who called upon this name that he's now proclaiming, has he not come here for this purpose? To bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He was proving. He knew firsthand. He had a story to tell. So this is what I want to do. I want to teach you guys a little tool that most of you already know. And it's a little bit of a testimony tool. And it, it's really about 90 seconds where you can tell your story. That's all it takes, 90 seconds. Because listen, nobody wants to hear anybody long-winded like me, right? They want bite-sized conversations. And I, I want to show you something. You can write it in your notes, draw it on your phone, whatever you do. But it, it's this, that we have a life before Christ. Who we were, like Saul, who was angry, who breathed out threats and murder, who who had a mission, and there were all these things opposed to God. This is not a chance to relive all of your glory days of sin, but it's who you are as a person. And then the moment of salvation, that moment that you experienced Christ and he transformed your life forever, where you were, what you were doing, what took place in your heart, and then simply your life after Christ with an invitation to join it, to say, Man, this is who I was, this is what Jesus did, and this is who I am now and striving to be. Man, would you want to know my Jesus? And this can take 30 seconds. All you got to do is sit down at lunch today and talk about it with your family. What's your story? Who were you before Christ? Some of you go, oh man, I was so little when I accepted Christ. Yes, but what Scripture says is we are enemies of God, children of wrath. But then there is a moment where Jesus changes everything. And you go, Clint, I know how to do this. I'm sure you do, but when was the last time we blew a little dust off this story? That we took it off the shelf and we began to say, hey, here's my story. So here's my challenge. Y'all work on this at lunch today, and then my challenge is this. That you share your 90-second story with one person before Christmas. You've got a whole month where you can just say, hey, and no cheating, I'm going to share it with my son. Uh Uh-uh. All right? Like, you you find somebody in your sphere of influence and say, hey, can I share my story? This is who I was. This is what Jesus did. This is who I'm trying to be now. And I want you to share that because any story that has Jesus at the center is powerful in the hands of God. Saul was proving that Jesus was the Christ. So here's the last thing, and I absolutely love it because I see it here often at Concord, and I've experienced it personally. Number three is this, we are better together. Come on, that's good, is it not? I mean, life is tough alone. When you try to be good enough, when you try to wear all the weight and the anxiety and and be strong enough and be righteous enough, we are better together. Look in verse 23, and when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. But they were watching the gates day 
and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Did you guys catch that? It says, but his disciples. His disciples. So, so get this with Saul. He was persecuting the disciples. He became a disciple. And then he was making disciples. Now, if you've been around Concord any length of time, that's kind of our, our phrase. That's our, our mission statement is we're going to make disciples everywhere. And Saul persecuted them, became one, and then had his own. But I've got a real question for us. I told you, man, I want, I want God just to mess with you today. Do you have disciples? Are you as a believer making disciples? The Great Commission commands us from the mouth of Jesus to make disciples. And making disciples is not having a Bible study, leading a class, going to coffee with somebody, having accountability. A disciple is someone that you are pouring your faith into in a way that they're pouring it into someone else, that they're pouring it into someone else. Discipleship is about replication. It's not about you pouring into somebody. That's a teacher. A disciple maker is someone who pours into someone who then pours into someone else. This very same guy wrote in a letter to a pastor, 2 Timothy, he said this, Timothy, what you've heard from me, teach to faithful men who will teach others also. Four generations, disciples come generationally. Do you have people lining up behind you that you're pouring into? It says his disciples. And I love it because this is where it, it, it just takes on a life of its own. That, that it says his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Think about this scene. There's several up of them, and they're in the, the city wall. And they're trying to get him down, but there are guards everywhere, and they are trying to kill him. And it's not like they're kind of trying to kill him. They're trying to snuff him out. It is a full-blown hit on Saul. And so these guys grab a rope, and they tie it around him and do this. Oh, man, that's a little too tight. Hey, hey, hey man, shh. we got to get you out of here. And they, they kind of climb him over the wall, and, and they're kind of lowering him down. And, and that first little bit where he lets go, and it kind of pulls the rope, and they're all holding on to it. And they lower him down just a little bit, and they're holding on to the rope. Maybe it's burning their hands just a little bit. He's getting heavier and heavier. And they're going, hey, be quiet, man. We've almost got it. We've almost got it. And then all of a sudden, they hear the horses round the corner around the gate. And here they come, man. They're looking anywhere. They got torches. And so all of a sudden, they just hold and stop. And he hits the Mission Impossible pose and just hangs there. Quiet as can be, trying to catch the sweat. And they go back and forth, and then the horse stops underneath them, and, and they're just going, where is this guy? And he's just hanging there. And you look up, and these disciples that he's got, and they're holding on to the rope, and all of a sudden, their, their, their forearms start to fatigue. Their hands are giving out. Their shoulder muscles are burning because they're just holding him and holding him. They're going through the pain to let him down. You know what's crazy about his disciples? We have no clue who they are. No notoriety. Everything that they've done is in complete obscurity. But at the end of their rope, they hold a man who's responsible for three missionary journeys across multiple continents, 13 of your New Testament books in the Bible, and a lot of us can line our faith up after Paul. In their hands, with no name mentioned, with no notoriety given, they are playing their part. Can I tell you something, church? Most of what we do for the gospel, no one will ever see. It will be in complete obscurity. And you know what? That's okay. Because we've not been called for our glory, but to play a part in his story. See, Saul that night needed those guys because he understood we are better together. These men, with no names given, were linchpins in the ministry that would go to the ends of the earth. And when he had come to Jerusalem, verse 26, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. You see this man Barnabas, the son of encouragement, 
A man we met in Acts chapter 5, remember that he sold a piece of property and brought it to the apostles and Ananias and Sapphira were the picture of the, the image of keeping up with a man like Barnabas who was full of integrity. This Barnabas had a, a reputation of doing what's right. And what he does is he takes this new convert who nobody wants to be around. Isn't this the guy? And he puts his arm around him. And he says, come on, bud, come with me. And he takes him into the apostles. And he goes, hey, I'm just telling you, this guy's story is for real. He met Jesus. He's been transformed. He's baptized. He has preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He's the real deal. Barnabas was putting his reputation on the line for this new convert. How many of you have been the recipient of somebody that's vouched for you, that's put you in a position to win, that's had your back in ministry? That's what Barnabas did in this moment. But how many of us are ready to be on the other side of that? That we want to use our influence our access to help those who are on the outskirts to go, hey man, I want you to be all God's called you to be. I want to give you the access you need to help you be the one that God has called you to be because one life can change the world. I'm telling you, it just takes one moment of putting your arm around somebody, inviting them to come along with you. I, I think about this, there's this statistic out right now that says that people are more open to an invite during the Christmas season to come to church than, than most any other time that most people get this would say this, I would go if somebody would take, take me with them. That should just send a shiver down your spine. That there are people that we do life with, that we work with, that live in a house or two down, that are on our kids' balls team, that, that, that are this, there, or somewhere else. And they're saying, I would go if somebody would just take me with them. That you bring them with you. That they, they come with you. We've actually got a brand new series starting next week called Christmas Trees. We're going to look at four trees in Scripture that, that speak to Jesus coming and being the one sent by God. It's, it's going to be an awesome series. But for the next three Sundays and then Christmas Eve, which is Friday night, which I want all of you to be here to celebrate with us, who could you be bringing with you? You say, hey, man, I want you to come. I, I, I want to clear out a whole road because we got a couple of families with us and, and we've got people going to come and hang out with us. That's what Barnabas did for Saul. God called him to something, but he couldn't get in. And, and Barnabas said, hey, come with me. He put his arm around him. The impact of us being better together. But watch the result in verse 28. So he, that's Saul went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Did I not tell you Acts 9 is so much more than just a conversion story? It is the standard for our life. That we can remember what Jesus has done to change us completely. That, that, that we can understand that, that we have a clear message to share. It takes 90 seconds to tell our story. And that we're always better together. So I've got three questions to end and then we're going to worship one more song together. I want you to think about these three questions. I want you to talk about them. I want you to pray through them. I want you to, to, to really wrap your mind around this. Is, is number one, has your life been completely changed by Jesus? Because there's a big difference in knowing about Jesus, church, amen, and truly knowing Jesus. Hey, you can spot a fake a mile away, can you not? That plays the games, that says the words, that has the t-shirt, but I just know about Jesus. I've been Jesus proximity. I've been close. And knowing Jesus, has Jesus changed you completely? And as you work on your testimony today at lunch and tonight with your family or your friends or somebody that you came with, who is someone in your life that you can take 90 seconds and tell what Jesus has done in your life with. Are you willing to step out and have one conversation in the next month about what Jesus has done in your life? Or are you going to say, oh, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. They'll never know. Or number three, who is someone 
that you can bring with you. That you could say, hey, man, we're chasing after Jesus. We've got this great community. We want to grow together. We want to do life together. We want to impact the world together. Hey, would you come with me? Who would you bring with you starting next week? At this time, I want to ask all of our campus pastors at our campuses to come forward. And I, I'm going to ask that they just take this moment where we pray together, where we worship together, where we finish off our service. And so campuses, I'm going to give you your room in this moment. For Claremont, I want to take a time just to pray. I want to ask you to be honest before the Lord. So would everybody just bow their heads and close their eyes. And I want you just to take a moment to ponder these three questions. Has Jesus changed me completely? Or do I just know the Christianese? Do I just know the game? Do I just know the church? What, what do I know? Or do I need to know Jesus? If you don't know him, we would love to talk with you. To just share with you who Jesus is. Because there's a difference in knowing about him and truly knowing him. But I also want you to think about an opportunity to share Jesus with someone in your sphere of influence. That you would say, God, I, in this moment, I just want to pray for an opportunity to use my voice for 90 seconds to tell of what you've done. God, would you line up an opportunity for me? God, I'm scared. God, I have fears. God, I'm uncomfortable. That's not my personality. Whatever it is, lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, I want to speak of what you've done in my life. And thirdly, would you say, God, I don't want the holiday season, the Christmas season to be all about me and my schedule and my timing. God, I want to be used by you. God, I want to pray for this family or this teammate or this, this friend or, or this neighbor. And God, I pray that, that you would allow me to bring them along with me. That we could study God's word together, that we could eat together, that we could worship together, that we could do the Christmas season together. God, would you give me courage? Would you give me time to bring them along with us? Father, in this time, we want to be very real. We want to say we're all in with you. God, would you change us completely? For those that do not, do not know you, God, would we just take a moment here just to, to speak with them? God, for those who are scared to to share their testimony or haven't shared it in a while, would you just line up an opportunity? And Father, would you give them courage to bring people along with them? The whole month of December, would you come with me? Would you be with my family? Would you eat with us? Would you, would you spend your, your Sundays with us? And God, we just anticipate you doing powerful things. So Lord, we thank you for this study through the book of Acts. God, that you would encourage our hearts. We would wrestle with your truth. And God, we would be the children, the disciples, the followers that you've called us to be, living in full power for the name of Jesus. We love you, and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen and amen.